Hi everyone, I'm Betsy Rothermel. I'm Program Director in Herpetology and Restoration Ecology. And today I'll be giving a shorter version of a talk I gave last June at the Landscape Conservation Summit in Fort Myers that was organized by Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. The original talk was a tag team effort with my co-presenter Neil Halstead at Wildlands Conservation. We focused on the magnitude and trends in tortoise translocations that are happening statewide highlighting critical knowledge gaps regarding translocation outcomes and consequences. As I'm going to describe, the magnitude of permitted translocations of, state threatened, of the state-threatened species has risen sharply in recent years due to accelerating development of upland habitats throughout Florida. But the implications of this large-scale movement of tortoises are not well understood either for the translocated tortoises or for the ecological communities in the donor and recipient landscapes. So just to give you a background on the legal status of gopher tortoises, uh, Florida instituted some protections in the 1980s, including banning harvest. However, the species was not state listed until 2007. These westernmost populations that are in that little tan blob on the map were listed as federally threatened under the Endangered Species Act in 1987. In 2011, the tortoise became a candidate species for possible federal listing throughout its range. And that stimulated a lot of range-wide analyses and conservation planning, including new population modeling and a species status assessment that was then published in 2021. In its subsequent 2022 finding, the Fish and Wildlife Service retained federal protection for those Western distinct population segment, but it deemed that the Eastern segment did not meet the criteria for listing. In other words, it stuck with the status quo. Importantly though, all the state level protections that were throughout the species range never went away and those are still in place. This recent decision of Fish and Wildlife Service notwithstanding, populations of gopher tortoises are not really very stable and further declines are expected. So this is a map from the species of status assessment with little stars where they identified over 600 local populations of gopher tortoises. About 19% of these were very large populations considered to have high resiliency or high probability of um, persistence over the next 80 years in the face of various threats. But about 55% of these were deemed to be too small and, and have low, low resiliency. Um, the SSA came out with a, an estimate of tortoise abundance of 150,000 tortoises range-wide. That, that is a very rough estimate. But what is clear is that um, you can see that nearly half of these existing populations are down here in peninsular Florida. So let's zoom into the situation in Florida since this is considered a stronghold for the species. When the tortoises were listed at the state of Florida, FWC devised a management plan and established a program that issues permits for relocation of tortoises from areas being developed to other sites having suitable habitat. So starting in 20, 2009, entities that were clearing occupied tortoise habitat for development could no longer bury or entomb the tortoises. They instead are required to relocate them and pay mitigation fees. On these recipient sites, um, they can be either on site within the property boundary where the development is happening, or they are more typically off site to a permitted recipient site. So, this graph is showing the number of permits that have been issued. However, there are widely varying numbers of tortoises translocated under each permit. So, to understand the magnitude of what's happening, we really need to look at records for the actual numbers of tortoises that have been moved. And that's what this is showing. Um, this is the number of tortoises relocated off-site to long-term protected recipient sites through 2021. And you can see there's a generally increasing trend. If we look at, in total, from 2009 to 2022, 87,572 gopher tortoises have been moved under the three most common permit types. So if you remember back to my earlier slide, this means a pretty large proportion of all remaining gopher tortoises in the world are being moved around within the state of Florida. Another trend we're seeing is that more of the larger populations, the ones that are supposed to be moderately or highly resilient to future threats, are now starting to be somewhat drained of some of their tortoises via permanent translocations. So a big important question is where are all these tortoises being moved to? And I don't have time to really go into that, but that is something that Neil is looking at he has preliminary data showing that not surprisingly, there's sort of net export of tortoises from urbanizing counties, think Orlando, to more rural counties. So what are the implications of these mitigation-driven translocations for gopher tortoise conservation? I'm just gonna briefly review sort of current state of knowledge. 
Um, before I delve into that, these are sort of typical metrics that you would think of to assess the outcomes of any translocation effort. A basic me measure of success, of course, is whether the animals actually remain on the site after release. This is addressed in FWC's permitting guidelines, which require penning in soft release enclosures for a minimum of six months. And obviously the translocated animals um, need to survive and reproduce. So in order for the population to persist. And then finally, you wanna see animals um, behaving in adaptive ways. So settling in burrows, selecting suitable habitat. The permitting guidelines require recipient sites to manage habitat, report mortalities and conduct population and habitat monitoring every few years. But there's really a need for more detailed data in Florida to thoroughly evaluate these relocation outcomes. And for that end, we had a grant from FWC in 2022 to census the tortoise population at the Fort Bassinger recipient site in Highlands County, which is owned and managed by South Florida Water Management District. Based on our four month survey effort, we estimated at least 78% of translocated tortoises were still alive. This is compared with sort of typical annual survival that you see in natural populations of around 92% for adults and 75% for immatures. Um, that 78%, of course, is that's over like five years. So it's a little not comparable, but anyway, <laughs> nearly a quarter of all um, the captures were hatchlings or juveniles, which suggests that reproduction is occurring though we have no way of knowing how many of those young were produced by translocated versus resident tortoises that were already there. So this may be one of only about two recipient sites in Florida where we have any data on post-translocation survival under the modern sort of guidelines. There's also very little data on the health or disease status of gopher tortoises at recipient sites. The stresses of translocation can lead to reduced immune function and mortality. And that does appear to be what happened at this Nagosi plantation site up in the Panhandle. They had a morbidity and mortality event in 2013 to 2015. And despite really detailed examination testing, it's still a little unclear what caused the mortality. Their ongoing surveillance has detected the two mycoplasma bacteria that are associated with upper respiratory tract disease in tortoises, as well as a ranavirus. So those may have been implicated. We did some health screening of tortoises at the Fort Bassinger site as well. More than half of the transloc translocated tortoises that we recaptured had one or more signs of respiratory illness. This little one here. Um, we didn't see excessive mortality, but um, PCR testing of swab samples detected one of the mycoplasma bacteria associated with URTD, as well as a couple of other bacteria who right, right now, we're not sure what their pathogenicity actually is. The Nagosi researchers had recommended keeping densities less than 1.2 per acre to head off disease issues, but that was sort of just based on what they saw at their site. It wasn't a controlled or replicated study. What was interesting and maybe coincidental is that we found that tortoise density at Fort Bassinger was right about at 1.2 per acre. At the individual level, um, there can be some genetic issues to think about. So, there was a recent study of desert tortoises that found that individuals with higher genetic diversity, that is higher heterozygosity, were more likely to survive post-translocation. And individual heterozygosity was a better predictor of survival than how far the animals had been moved, which it suggests that the standard practice of minimizing that distance you're moving animals may not always be the best approach. At a population level, if you're thinking about interbreeding and outcrossing of genetically divergent individuals from different populations, that can boost offspring fitness. And we see this um, genetic rescue in examples like Florida panther. However, outcrossing is not guaranteed to have favorable outcomes. In some cases, if you're crossing individuals from very genetically divergent populations, you can actually produce less fit offspring. So that's just not something that's been studied in, in the gopher tortoises. A concern I have is what is the security of the long-term recipient sites? They are protected by permanent easements and the site owners are required to manage habitat, but there are these other big threats like climate change, sea level rise and invasive predators. So as a recent example, I heard that he, Hurricane Ian just pounded a recipient site on Sanibel Island you know, as early on in its path of destruction um, so those coastal sites are certainly at increased risk from stronger storms and higher sea levels that are you know, exacerbating this, this storm surge. 
And when it comes to invasive predators, I'm concerned about this big lizard, this Argentine tegu that's expanding its range inland and northward. This is a species that eats eggs of brown nesting species, and it's known to eat juvenile gopher tortoises. So switching gears a little, I want to think a little bit about the broader implications. So many of you, you have probably heard gopher tortoises referred to as keystone species or ecosystem engineers. This is an app, the ecosystem engineer term is applicable. They're affecting other organisms by creating, modifying, maintaining these unique habitats. They dig many deep burrows burrows throughout their life, and hundreds of other species are known to use the burrows. We have obligate invertebrate commensals that de entirely dependent on gopher tortoises for their life cycle. We have a lot of vertebrates like gopher frogs, eastern indigo snakes that are using these as, as important refuges. I won't go into detail on this, but just say that there is mounting evidence of the keystone functions of gopher tortoises. So their burrowing and foraging activities have been shown to enhance diversity of both vertebrate and plant communities. And I'm bringing this up because given these ecosystem effects that they can have, I think we should expand how we're thinking about these translocations. We're not just adding and removing tortoises, we're adding and removing their keystone functions. So if you're sensing that there are some large knowledge gaps, you're correct, uh, first and foremost, we don't know how many of those translocated tortoises are still alive and present on any of the recipient sites throughout Florida. We need well-designed studies to understand factors influencing post-translocation success, um, such as stocking density, habitat quality on the recipient sites, very poor understanding of disease dynamics, which are complicated. It would be helpful to collect genetic data at recipient sites to answer a variety of questions, including whether the current guideline of not moving gopher tortoises 100 miles north and south is justified. And I mentioned the threats posed by climate change and invasive predators. It seems like you could do some modeling to identify which recipient sites maybe are most at risk from those. And then thinking more broadly, translocations of keystone species are not unprecedented. There have been a number of studies of the conservation benefits of reintroducing for example, prairie dogs or other mammalian keystone species, but we haven't looked at the ecosystem consequences of translocating this keystone reptile species. Uh, so we just may be missing some opportunities to examine how ecosystems are affected by this large scale redistribution of tortoises. So we need to do like significant rapid scaling up of, of research. Of course, this is a scientist saying this. Um, to evaluate these translocation outcomes and inform translocation practices. And given limited resources, we really need to be prioritizing and fostering collaborative research, like by collecting similar data across a network of sites to answer maybe a common set of questions. We sh um, are gonna need to be interacting with agencies, NGOs, and stakeholders at different stages of the research process to ensure that the results are timely and they're gonna really move the needle for conservation outcomes. And toward that end, Archbold um, is leading an effort with, with buy-in from Gopher Tortoise Council and Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission to prioritize and facilitate that kind of collaborative research. So um, Josh Daskin, the conservation director here, and I organized an initial workshop last fall to start examining these knowledge gaps, what are the barriers to conducting research on recipient sites, and how can we start working collaboratively to develop an actionable research agenda? So this is just getting off the ground, so stay tuned for more in the future about that. And I just want to be sure to acknowledge uh, FWC for funding and technical assistance, and other me folks mentioned here for help with data collection and analysis. Don't know if there's time for questions, but thank you. Is um, getting ready. We could ask one question. Yeah. 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 So they are being okay. The relocations are being kept track of at some level. Um, these are often, you know, consultants that are doing this. There's a lot of consultants that are hired to do the actual relocating. And these are permitted recipient sites. They're required to do 
habitat monitoring and like burrow surveys every few years after the tortoises are, after the recipient site is established. So there is a level of keeping track, but it's not the level of like going out and seeing how many of those translocated tortoises are actually still there. Uh, um, it's very, I would say, it's like the habitat is still there. We're still seeing burrows. Um, yeah, but it is a big effort. I mean, it took us four months to census the site, the one site that we looked at. And uh, there's a whole economic side of this, of course, where if the recipient sites were required to do that more intensive population monitoring, it would be hugely more effort intensive and expensive, and it might hinder them even wanting to be recipient sites, right? So hopefully that answers that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Introduce yourself. Okay. Um, hello everyone. We're just trying to get this set up. Uh, my name is Shafali Azad, and I'm a data manager primarily focusing on um thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it. Primarily focusing on um, data that's collected at the, the agriculture program and cattle operations at Buck Island Ranch. Um, okay, well, we're gonna see if I can navigate this, but then I can, and I'm gonna also close this. We don't need to be missing that. Um, okay, before I actually get into the content of this talk, I want to give a quick shout out to the form. As you can see, this is um, not your typical slideshow. This is a story map that I made in ArcGIS. Um, I wanted to challenge myself to make a story map. It turns out it was incredibly easy, very intuitive. If you, like me, spend a lot of your time sort of looking at spreadsheets and databases and are maybe aesthetically challenged, um, they do, Esri does a lot of the formatting for you. It's a lot of drag and drop. It looks very pretty. Um, shout out to Angeline Meeks for helping me put this together. And also the data and GIS lab is a resource. If you want to make story maps yourself, I suggest that you try it out in 2024. Okay, so um, this is a talk that I presented at a conference last year. And the theme of the conference was the never ending data story, which is really what data management is about. Um, this is a story of a process that are no conclusions that are just outcomes and takeaways. But really this is a story about the long-term agroecosystem research network, um, which I am going to be calling LDAR. So the LDAR network is this partnership of 18 sites across the continental United States that are distributed um, across a variety of agricultural ecosystems. And the network's mission is to sort of investigate collaborative strategies for the development of sustainable intensification um, within agricultural ecosystems. Um, and so the network is really interested in investigating these interactions between agricultural production, ecosystem services, as well as sort of societal well-being within rural communities. So each site is sort of investigating this business as usual strategy that's, pres that's prevalent within the agroecosystem within that region. And they're also sort of like investigating um, an aspirational strategy that meets the goals of the network. Data management is really important to the network. It is one of the strategic initiatives laid out. And as a consequence, each of the 18 sites have data management representatives that are sort of collaborating on data strategies, not only for their sites, but also for the network at large. Um, so to sort of recontextualize this um, to an ecosystem that is familiar to a lot of us, um, I'm not sure why that put it a lot, but Ashford Biological Station, along with partners at the University of Florida, um, maybe we'll go on internet, unfair. Okay. Um, from one of the sites in the LDAR network, and we're sort of representing 
um, the subtropical humid grazing lands of the southeastern United States. Uh, you know, maybe this is a disadvantage to having it dependent on the internet. Now your my images are lost. I'm gonna try to reload this to see if that helps at all. Um, so, but here at Buck Island Ranch, we are trying to, our common experiment is looking at full burn versus batch burn grazing within our improved and semi-native, oh, lovely, within our improved and semi-native pastures. And we're sort of trying to understand these relationships between agricultural production, land use, land management, and natural resources. Um, so we have cowboys and scientists that are working together to manage this land, to work this land. And we have over 30 years of land management as well as scientific research from Buck Island Ranch. There's this incredible video. If not, if you watched it, um, there's a clickable link and you can watch it in the future. But we are not the only site in the network that have this long history of research, a lot of the, all of the 18 sites um, similarly uh, have been collecting that data for decades. This is an infographic that the data management working group put together in 2021. So it is a little outdated, but you can see there's a substantial amount of data and publications and streaming data, um, over 1200 years of combined research that is coming out of this network. And so, the big question was really, how do we know what we have? How do we understand um, what we've collected already so that we can identify the gaps um, and ask questions about, ask multi-site questions, research questions with the knowledge that we already have. Um, so this is our challenge going into the data inventory project, which is a project that I've been involved in and co-leading for the past five plus years. Um, the question was, how do we make metadata accessible to our scientists and to our broader stakeholders in the service of collaborative research? Okay, so version one of the data inventory was produced in 2019 and all of the sites submitted the metadata catalogs um, to the network. We did this in Google Sheets we used um, Esri's Insights platform to sort of visualize the data, to develop a data dashboard. And what we found is that there was a lot of variance, not just in the types of data that were reported, but also even the extent, the number of data sets. Um, and so we looked a little further into that and we found that data managers could really be, had organized themselves along a spectrum of what we call lumpers and splitters. So for instance, if there's this field with say 20 soil probes in it, if you were a lumper like me, that might just be two rows in your catalog, which is like soil moisture and soil temperature. If you were a splitter, you might go ahead and consider each one of those sensors as their own data row. And so that contributed to some amount of variance. Um, we also found that sites use different variables to describe what is essentially the same phenomenon. So P, phosphorus, Soil P, um, they're essentially talking about the same thing, but it leads in a lack of ability to cross compare and lack of machine readability. And so we started working on version two, which was an iterative cleanup of what we already had. Um, and that was produced in May, 2020. So we sort of went to do um, manually we sort of manually tried to define broader categories within which this data could fit. We arrived at convergence on some variables. We standardized dates and units using some scripts in our codes. We started working with partners that already had controlled vocabularies, trying to see if we could use their vocabularies to fit our data in. We developed a second data visualization dashboard. This time we did it in Tableau. Um, and again, there's a link, and that's one of um, the fun things about a story map. You can embed links in there for people to explore it at their own pleasure. 
Um, we also identified this need for a collaborative platform within which to book. So we found that we really needed version tracking as people were adding to their inventories. We really needed the ability for people to be able to comment on specific rows as we were developing controlled variables. And we sort of arrived on a platform called, we did a cross comparison and we arrived at a platform called Airtable, which we thought met all of our needs. All right, um, how am I on time? I don't wanna to get too much into the weeds, but I did throw this timeline out here just so that we could sort of like get an idea of um, how the gears of the government grind slowly and all of the bureaucratic red tape you have to go through to do anything at all. Um, so really briefly, like we first identified a need for a data inventory in 2018 at the annual meeting. We produced a preliminary version of it later that summer, and then what we what I call version one in my talk in May of 2018. Um, later in 2018, we were already starting to work through and do this iterative cleanup. We had identified that platform that we wanted was Airtable, and we passed it through to leadership, um, formally requesting a corporate account. Um, this we were simultaneously sort of identifying. I'm trying to identify these different control vocabularies by NEON, by Meriflux, by National Ag Library that we could use. And we found that they were useful for these biophysical domains, but not quite these like economic and social and agricultural specific domains that Eldar was encompassing. Um, okay, so late 2020, early 2021, we sort of uh, had Airtable declined as a platform, and this was because it needed something called FedRAM certification, which is something that the federal government needs to do, use any of its software. Um, it costs a lot of money to do the certification. That was one of the reasons. And so the project kind of took a backseat. We tested other platforms. None of them worked quite as well as we wanted. In the meanwhile, a lot of other working groups within the network were starting to like use what we'd already collected and develop their own controlled vocabularies. Um, and that was an ongoing effort. Um, all right, fast forward to 2022, the network developed this framework for indicators of sustainability that you may have seen really briefly in Josh's talk. And so it organized our research into these three domains, the environmental, the economic, the social. Um, and so for example, if we have this attribute for atmospheric health and a sustainable indicator might be greenhouse gas mitigation, Thank you. Um, but how do we actually get at knowing whether or not we've achieved greenhouse gas mitigation? We sort of need access to the data sets, the carbon fluxes, methane fluxes that go into that calculation. And so there was renewed interest in the data inventory and having a place where we could all work together. Um, at this point, I threw my hands up in the air and I was like, you guys, we've been going back and forth over this for too long. Can Archboard as a non-federal site just sponsored accounts and you can all use it. And after a lot of, frankly, clandestine phone calls, um, this was, we were given the green light and Ashford did sponsored accounts in, as of 2023. Um, the network has been using Airtable for not just the data inventory, but a lot of different projects, um, developing control vocabulary, storing lexicons, sort of just a space that people can, um, develop different kinds of metadata catalogs. And with that, we're working on version three, it is in the works. I will, I will call it, I think I'm at time. We won't keep the clandestine phone calls in the recording. <laughs> <laughs> they were not recorded, none of them were. <laughs> Yes, yeah. Okay. So, um, questions for Chef? Well, okay. They're all stored within silos at the individual site. So this was an attempt at just sort of getting all the metadata into one place, but we are trying to also push for a centralized platform where we can store the actual data in of itself. Um, again, that is a long process. We've been trying working on it for years and yeah, we'll, we'll get there when we get there. Yeah. Any 
Well, if there's no other questions, I could add that uh, also we are using other sanctuary databases like um, Ameriflux in Harvard later. So trying to reinvent the wheel for some Right. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. She is an award winning data manager. So yeah. Mm -hmm. No problem. All right, good morning. I am Kevin Main, and I'm the land manager here at Archibald Biological Station. Been here a couple of years, and we are going to talk about uh, some stuff out on the, the reserve today. So this is just a general um, kind of update on things that are happening on the reserve. So uh, it's important to note first off that this is not just me. This is, uh, this is a lot of people that work out on the reserve and there's a lot going on. Uh, uh, primarily, we're looking at two sides, uh, the land management and then the operations. So the operations, everything to do with cattle. That's primarily Jean, uh, Mary Margaret and some of the other staff from Buck Island that take care of the cows out here. And there's a lot of coordination between us. You know, If we're gonna do something like a burn, then we need to make sure the you know, the cows are off and, and they can't come back on for a certain amount of time. And, and so there's a lot of interaction between um, both sides of that to make sure that uh, everything's functioning and happening properly. Uh, and that we're meeting, we have a lot of shared goals as far as fuel management and, and grazing. Um, uh, and that, that's what makes the reserve run, working together. All right, let's see, yeah, there we go. Okay, as far as cattle operations, um, there's currently about 280 head of cattle out on the reserve. Um, that's probably a little bit low, but uh, we're being uh, cautious with that and uh, probably bumping it up a little bit over time. But uh, um, right now that's where we are. Um, I work uh, with Gene and we do a lot of fire planning together as far as which units we're planning on burning and also the fire prep, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, we have the standard rotation of, of cattle through the different pastures uh, based on how long they've been grazing and whether or not a unit was burned. Um, the cowboys maintain all the fencing on the reserve. All these red lines are all the new fences that, were, that we had funding for from NRCS in the last few years. So we've got several, several new fences, but then all those black lines are all a lot of old fences. And so there's, we're talking 40 plus miles at well, 20 plus miles of fencing probably um, to take care of. And then they also maintain all the watering facilities and they manage all the hunting. So here's a, a sample watering facility. We have watering facilities uh, across the reserve so that there's at least one uh, water trough in, in each pasture. Uh, there's several solar wells and one solar well may feed several troughs. Um, some of the, there's underground pipelines and some of them are quarter mile long or longer. Um, and so we have less dependence now than uh, on the old, the, there's a lot of cow ponds um, out there. And uh, during the very dry periods of the year, those cow ponds would dry up and some of these pastures would not have water. So that's been resolved. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, this is what our barns look like on the reserve. Uh, they're small and they're old. Um, they, these were existing when we got the reserve in 2002. Um, we're hoping to get some funding to have a little bit more uh, storage for our equipment. Uh, this is the condition of the reserve road. If you've, there's one major road that goes in um, through the reserve and out to the cow pens and that gets used um, for uh, moving cattle and, and equipment and uh, this past year, we've, with all the rainfall, we've had uh, extended periods where there are parts of the road underwater, and you do end up with some rutting like this, um, which makes it harder to move uh, cattle in and out, especially. Uh, it's not a, not a real pediment to just you know, run in four by fours out. Um, so we are looking to, to hopefully get some funding to, to do some repairs to the road. Uh, another project that's related to cattle on the reserve is we have some funding through the NRCS CSP program, which uh, is providing some mowing of some of the pastures. So these uh, these pastures here are all being mowed 
uh, some of them once, some of them twice over a five-year period. And that mulling is to help reduce uh, the woody species, especially the structure and the size of the woody species. The mulling is not necessarily going to, to kill too many of those things because they will re-sprout, but it does allow us to, to mow some of the thicker areas that um, don't typically like to burn because things are, the grasses are starting to get shaded out. So this helps to, to mow some of those areas down, encourage the grasses, and then we can hopefully get more fire running through. Um, in the past year, we've done several burns, primarily for cattle uh, management. Um, the wet, we have had a lot of wet weather, which has uh, caused some issues with uh, getting burns done and especially fire prep. Um, so we'll see what happens with this spring. Right now it's too wet to, to do much on the reserve. Um, so I'm hoping it dries out some so we can get some burns done. Okay, I talk a little bit about the land management side. Um, so we're gonna just go over some mechanical treatments that we've done, talk about fire prep, the burn plan, a little bit on the exotics, and if we have time, some photo points. So this is one of the projects we did in 2021, we, we, uh, we got uh, the call from NRCS that uh, they wanted us to be able to graze cattle better on our first easement on the reserve, which is the GRP. Um, that program was designed for cattle grazing and we didn't have a lot of cattle grazing that, on that unit because we had, over time, had ended up with a lot of uh, big, tall trees that had started shading things out. So NRCS told us that they uh, wanted that opened up and they gave us funding to do so. So we went in with heavy equipment. We got a contractor and he went in and basically just chopped the trees off at the base and let them fall. And that happened in 2021. And let's see here. This was the extent of it. So this is the GRP, it's about 90 acres. And most of that was cut. And then another section up here in this uh, nursery south pasture. Um, they tried to avoid most of the natural areas. So this bay head was avoided. Uh, a couple wetlands that were also avoided. And this is just a before and after picture at one spot. And you can see how in, in three years, the grasses have recovered very well. Um, we still have a lot of dead and rotting uh, branches and, and trees that we're trying to get rid of, but that's gonna take a while. So what we're trying to do is mow yearly, or burn, I'm sorry, burn yearly uh, to encourage that grass and to reduce the amount of re-sprouting from those stumps. So all those trees that we cut down, a lot of them are gonna re-sprout at the base. And so if we can burn that yearly, we're gonna try and knock back those root systems and, and hopefully kill some of those. Um, so, so for the next few years, I'm, I'm trying to get out there annually and burn this and, not, and then also just burn up these old logs. Okay, another project on the reserve that uh, was some mechanical treatments. This was in the scrub at the southeast corner of the reserve. Uh, it's our southeast scrub unit. It had a history of, it's in fairly good shape, but it did have some history of mechanical disturbance in the past. And it was more open than a typical rosemary. And because of that, um, when you get in a situation like that, you've got, um, you want to try and run fire through um, and it just doesn't want to carry. And so Aaron, David, this is mostly his project. We're looking at uh, if we did some mechanical treatment, would that help spread out fuels and help a fire to carry better in rosemary? Um, and so this was a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service project. And I'll just point out that uh, even though it was extensive mowing, we did it in such a way that uh, we were very careful to uh, limit any kind of soil, dis soil disturbance. And this is kind of what it, what, what it looked like on the ground here. This, this ridge here of rosemary is, is that there. And so uh, uh, we blocked it off and then I did some mowing and that this was basically heads up mowing with the tractor. I had my steering wheel in one hand and had my field maps map in the other. 
and I could I could look where I was going and mow a big area and then mow it all out. And so that was that was a, a fun time. <laughs> it, it actually worked out pretty well. Um, and so uh, that that set up Aaron to do his um, his research. So we did the burn. Uh, burned out pretty well. Yeah, this is just a couple of pictures. This is some flatwoods down and toward the south end, uh, recovering nicely. And then this is a patch of rosemary that was both mowed and burned. Okay, uh, as far as the fire plans on the reserve, just looking at this over here, basically every year, almost all the units on the reserve come due for burning because we have them in this one to two or one to three year fire return interval. So even if you do a burn one year, it, it, you might come back and burn it the next year. Um, so most of the units are available to be burned. Uh, the reason we burn is for the cattle, but it's also trying not that woody species and, and then for all the native habitats. So some nice areas of flatwoods and, and scrub out there. Uh, right now it is too wet to burn and it's also too wet to do a lot of fire print. But stay tuned, I do hope to get out there and start doing that um, soon. Uh, just a word on fire prep. Mostly when I talk about fire prep on the reserve, it's disking. So we take our tractor and we'll disk around these fire breaks. Um, but it's a lot of work, uh, especially the last couple of years, it's been a lot of work because every, every time we had a new fence, if that fence didn't follow the exact same spot, like we had a new fence and it was bumped up here a little bit, then you're basically starting over with your disking and it and it's it's a it's takes longer to cut through those those grasses that haven't ever been disked before. So we had had to deal with that the last couple of years. Um, and then the smut grass, which most of this yellow in here is, is smut grass, is also very difficult to disk. So when you're talking about 40 plus miles of disking, that's because if we've got 20 miles of fence, then we're disking on both sides of that fence. So it really adds up and it's it's a lot of time commitment. But you got to have that before you can do the burn. Okay, a couple other things just touch on. We're starting a new uh, sampling and uh, we've got a field maps for uh, the exotic species on the reserve. And we're using field maps and, and following a grid layout so that we can keep track of uh, some data in a statistical manner. And then also, um, you know, track the treatments over time. So that's just now starting out. And okay, more more to come on that later. And uh, another thing is we're probably going to get a new easement on the reserve. It is not finalized yet, but we are in negotiations with NRCS, and it look, looks hopeful. Uh, that will protect another. Um, over a thousand acres here and fill in some of these gaps um, from all these other older easements that we already have. So looking forward to that. And we don't know exactly what the restoration um, will look like on those areas, but probably some more ditch bikes and um, you know, other ways of holding water back. Okay, uh, as long as I got a couple minutes, just a couple fun photo points uh, over the years. So most of our photo points uh, only for the reserve only date back about 20 years. Uh, but we do have a few fun points from, from the early 90s where we were basically looking over the fence. And uh, so this is a point uh, at the middle gate looking toward the Southwest. And here you can see in 92, a lot of trash. I'm not sure where it went to. I think there was some, I think maybe some of it might be buried out there. Um, but other than that, that, that area looks about the same. Uh, here's a different situation on the west side of, of the reserve where we once had cattle and now we don't have cattle. And it's also, I believe, wetter than it used to be. And this is an area that's hard, hard to get in for fire prep. And so there hasn't been as, many, as much fire down in this area. And you can see what 20 years can, can do. Um, here is in Flatwoods, down at the southwest corner, where basically all we've done is, is continue to burn and it's looking good. Um, here's toward the north end of the reserve in an area where we've uh, established the weir and put in 
uh, several ditch plugs as part of a WRP project. And we are seeing wetter conditions generally um, around that wetland up there. Um, this is on the east side of the reserve uh, in an area that uh, uh, Eric did a project uh, several years ago where they herbicided and also planted some scrub plants. And you can see in that short period of time that we have, we're, we're starting to see some, some nice looking scrub in, in, parts of the, uh, in parts of that pasture. And then my last one is uh, looking southwest in the cutthroat prairie, an area where we filled in an old cow, cow pond that we didn't need. Uh, it mostly came back with a lot of native grasses. And this is an area that is actively burned, but no longer grazed, but you can see that it is staying open. So that's it. Yes, and uh, while Sarah, we're, we're over Kevin, just one question while Sarah's moving on. Can you just slide up for people online? Uh, we're kind of repeat the question so that they can right. hear it. So does anyone have any questions for Kevin? Okay, thank you. Sure is. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Beers. I'm a research assistant in the Avian Ecology Program, and I'm going to talk to you all a little bit about our project investigating territory budding in Florida scrub jays and some new work that I've been working on as well. So a lot of this data was previously covered in my intern presentation. So after speaking a little bit about my prior work, which I know some of you have seen, I'll be also sharing some novel analyses that I've been working on and introducing a whole new project. Uh, but first and foremost, I would like to point out that um, the data that I've been presenting on was collected and um, inspired a lot by Dr. Reed Bauman, who we miss dearly. Florida scrub jays live in interspecific groups specifically family groups that delay their own dispersal um, or with older helpers that delay their own dispersal in order to help at their natal nest. And this help usually comes in the form of territory defense or the provisioning of nestlings despite their own sexual maturity and ability to breed. And it's suspected that um, this is done for the sake of remaining at home somewhere safe while they're waiting for breeding opportunities to arise because it's an oversaturated environment. Scrub jays operate on these narrowly defined boundaries and they treat intruders to these boundaries with especially intense aggression. And um, gaining and maintaining territory is a vital step in their life cycle as it's necessary to breed. And because there is often limited territories and it's oversaturated, the way in which you acquire a territory is often indicative of where you fall within uh, your group's hierarchy. Uh, among the many kinds of territory acquisition that jays operate under, I'll be focusing on territory budding for my talk. Um, territory budding is a pretty complicated and at times very lengthy process. As a helper, you will actively help expand your natal territory, expanding the size of it. And um, you ultimately would attract uh, another jay over, another jay that hasn't had any breeding experience to your own territory. And then you kind of sandwich your own territory in between um, the natal land and your neighbors. So um, in this example, we're seeing that this um, light blue helper is paired with this purple jay that's come in and made this new budded territory seen in this yellowish brown. And um, if we overlay the shape of that natal territory from 2000, we can see that it's inheriting a good chunk of the natal territory. Um, there is also this quirky methodology nicknamed replace budding, which is a combination of breeder vacancy replacement and budding. Um, so in the example shown, we're seeing that um, the, it's a similar situation with blue helper down at the bottom. And he has these this, uh, this couple that lives to the north of them. One of them dies, unfortunately. And um, the blue helper comes in and replaces 
that breeding position while also maintaining a good amount of middle territory. So combination of the two of them. The difference between these two is that um, this one that it mates with has experience and it's neighboring them. Um, budding is especially difficult towards the beginning of the process because um, you're messing up a lot of boundaries that have already been um, thoroughly enforced and established. And um, it often is like you're facing especially intense aggression from both the neighboring territories and your own middle territory. And um, because of this, it's a very competitive mode of acquisition that requires a relatively high quality J in order to maintain. Um, but the Js that are able to maintain themselves within a year or two see initially lowered breeding success, but within a year or two, they, um, that breeding success jumps and they see a massive improvement. Um, according to the current literature, the overwhelming majority of buds are male buds, um, with female budding really only occurring very rarely. Um, the long-term data set that I had initially um, analyzed explicitly only described six instances female budding and this line of thinking is very consistent with uh, various other studies of Florida scrub jays that have found females disperse earlier and further and males to remain close by and this delayed dispersal in philopatric males is considered a driver for budding. So um, there's currently no published data studying whether or not females are actually capable of budding and as well as this, my colleague Tori Bakley has described instances where female budding was either misrepresented or underrepresented in the data set and pushed me to ask whether or not females are capable of budding. But as well as this, um, but what are the differences between male and female budding in a species that has male biased um, philopatry? Specifically, I asked if female budding is truly as rare as previously described um, and if so, what are the social conditions that foster instances of female budding? Um, I predicted that females would uh, not only bud, uh, or would bud, wouldn't bud rarely, <laughs> but it would also be associated with a lack of older male helpers or brothers, and that they would be more likely to um, successfully bud if she had paired with uh, an experienced neighbor male, which is the same as uh, forming a replaced bud. Uh, additionally, I wondered if age of female butters compared to um, male butters, as well as whether or not um, females who bud were budding at the same age as like your average female would disperse normally. And I expected that um, female budding would have a high cost that might come with a form of either lower breeding success or a greater delay in dispersal. To answer this question, I used historical demography data and spatial polygons of all the territories that have been collected since 1977. Um, it's been going on for longer, but that's just when I chose to start. Um, additionally, these territories were, matched, or were mapped painstakingly each year by Glenn Wolfenden, Don Fitzpatrick, and Reed Bellman, and um, they did this at the Jays' peak territoriality using playback to incite, um, to incite clashes between uh, neighboring groups. Um, Previously, defining uh, the method of acquisition for a new territory was defined, um, was basically left up to the opinion of the individual researcher doing it. And a question like the one that I'm asking really necessitate, necessitated a truly objective way of defining a territory bud. So I elected to use spatial overlap to define that. And that's a method where I'm able to employ it over all the recorded territories and really removes any possibility of subjectivity. And I used package S, F, and R to calculate areas of overlap uh, between a newly formed territory and either breeder's natal territory of, from the year prior. And if that overlap existed, area was measured and compared to the whole middle territory. So if I pull up this original graphic that I had used earlier, um, I calculated this area outlined in red. Here. And then finally, I used a series of generalized linear mixed models uh, chi-squared analysis, Fisher exact tests to analyze for significance. So what did I find? Uh, um, I was able to isolate 148 instances of budding from the years of 1920 or 1977 to 2022. And of those buds, 21% were female, um, which is obviously a huge increase compared to the initial six that um, was listed in the data set. Um, as well as this, the composition of these buds were statistically similar, with both attaining similar percentages of natal territory. 
to investigate if some aspect of the female's social environment at the natal nest was allowing the female to bud. Um, I analyzed in the census data from the last month of the budding breeder was present at his or her natal territory and then counted age and sex to be group members excluding the biological parents. And then after I removed the biological parents and the breeder itself, um, all of those other group members were described as natal competitors. And I'll get more into this data in a moment, but um, generally we're seeing that both sexes bud less frequently with more competition, but equally so among male and female groups. Bear with me through the next couple of slides. Um, when analyzing the total number of, uh, of the budding breeders' natal competitors, we're seeing a definite downward trend peaking after one or two competitors, but uh, we of course can't say that this differs from uh, the normal group dynamics. Um, but what is unique is that a Fisher exact test revealed that um, males and females are responding equally between um, increasing natal competitors. And uh, looking solely at um, people at group members who are older than the budding J revealed the same thing. Uh, there's a downward trend, but not differently so between male and females. So no rare social environment is predisposing a female to bud. When looking at male natal competitors, we continue to see the same trend. And finally, I looked at both older and male competitors combined for each budding breeder's natal territory, and you, you guessed it, it's the same. Um, however, while the state of intragroup competition uh, did not seem to differ between the sexes, I did find that females were more likely to bud if their mate had bred prior to their, um, to their pairing. Uh, Chi-square analysis revealed that um, or between these three categories revealed that um, there was a significant difference between male and female butters in whether or not their male had bred prior. Where only about 32% of female buds were made up of novice females, um, only about 14% of the mates of male butters were known to be um, novice. Um, in these instances, or sorry, were known to be, have, have had experience. Um, in these instances, um, or another interesting thing that's happening is in this unknown category. Um, for those, it's basically um, a male is, or one of the butters is pairing with what we call a NOBA, and a NOBA has, stands for no bands, and it means that it's a J that has dispersed from outside of the track, so we don't know what's where, we don't know where it came from, we don't know its prior breeding experience. So we're seeing that males are pairing with NOBAs way more frequently than females are. So it's a 58 to one difference, which is pretty crazy. So in a very general sense, uh, we're, saying, we're seeing that female butters are mating with their neighbors while male butters are mating with mates. Another variable I wanted to test was um, age. I really didn't expect that age would affect one sex more than the other, but considering females are known to acquire territory at a younger age than males due to their early dispersal, I thought it might be interesting to see if males and females bud at the same age. Um, but I found that in this population, there's no significant difference between the age at which they, at which they bud between male and females. Um, I was then curious as to whether or not uh, females that bud were older than the average female. And um, though there are inherent differences between inheriting and budding, um, Sa and colleagues found that older males were more likely to inherit. So I thought maybe it'd be interesting if females reacted similarly to budding. And um, this data had kind of uh, already been collected for the average age of dispersal of a female helper. And compared to the average female, I ran a t-test and found that um, it's not or it is not significant. So there not budding significantly later or earlier. And I also wanted to see if females would have lower initial breeding success compared to males. And um, they didn't, they saw the same initial breeding success, um, which is what the t-test revealed. And um, so how do we do in our predictions? Um, Male budding still makes up the majority of all buds, but with this new methodology, we revealed way more female buds going from previously six explicitly defined female buds to 31. So our hypothesis was proven to be correct. 
In terms of social conditions, um, we did not see a specific social environment that necessitated, um, was necessary for females in particular to bud. They're both responding the same way to natal competition. Um, but we did see that females are more likely to bud if they mate with a male that has had prior breeding experience. Um, in terms of age, um, we were proven to be, it was proven to be correct in that males and females are not budding at different ages. Uh, and as well as this, females are also budding at the same age as other females. Um, the, and as well as this, we're also seeing that um, both male and female butters see the in same initial low breeding success. So that was proven to be wrong. Um, this is the first study to use spatial analysis to investigate territory acquisition as well as the first to highlight uh, female budding, which is cool, I think. Um, and it highlights that there's many layers to gender dynamics, even on a population level. Um, and it really leaves the question of um, if females also have the chance to bud, what is pushing them to leave so early? Um, and I don't think I have time to go into my new stuff, but um, I'll just uh, leave my acknowledgments and see if I have any questions. I think I The analysis of not getting more valuable than all <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, uh, interfere with their what? No, their uh, what's what we suspect is happening is that um, the 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 helper is like physically able to, but they lack the required stimuli. So they're, as long as they're pairing, that's really what's like onsetting that ovulation. But um, no, I don't, I don't think the method of territory acquisition would really interfere with them, just as much with their pairing in general. Yeah. Well, they're still working on the I'm just, I just wanted to say, it's really wonderful. So I, I have for years said males were more likely to bud than females. And I really appreciate you digging deep and saying is that actually true if I look objectively at the data. So good for you. Thank you. <laughs> How are we doing? Well, thanks, lovely. For those who have talks this afternoon, let's get them pre-loaded so we can speed this up. Or I can watch. <laughs> Are we good? We're sharing? Okay. Hello. Um, so I'm Vivian Slaughter. I'm the director of the Data and Technology Program. Um, and today I'm going to give a presentation or a version of a presentation that I gave at the Wildlife Conservation Drones and Technology Summit in October. Um, this talk was originally 45 minutes, um, and I've condensed it today for you significantly, so I have to move over some of the areas really quickly. So if you want to dive into more details, feel free to find me afterwards to talk about them. Um, so this talk is obviously about environmental monitoring that we do at Archibald Biological Station and history. So skipping us much of the introduction that I gave before, we're diving right in. And so here we have a map of the station and the ranch. Um, with the habitats that you all are familiar with, which I will not take the time to describe. Um, but if we move on to here, you can see these maps are showing all of the environmental monitoring locations that we have. Um, the point here is not to look at any point specifically, but to really understand the breadth of our monitoring efforts. It is the co-location of these data that allow for ground truthing and enable its use for modeling. And having this intensive monitoring um, at these sites really attract outside collaborators to come and work with us and work with our data. Um, Archibald's been really successful in this effort because we've invested in data management from the very beginning. Um, uh, one of the reasons that uh, the GIS and data management department is here um, is to support these long-term monitoring efforts um, to, and to ensure that the data are useful. Um, so we're really lucky that we've had institutional buy-in and funding to allow for act adequate data management of all of this environmental monitoring data. So let's dive into some of the environmental monitoring data that we have. Um, weather is the first one. We've been manually collecting weather data at 
8 a.m. daily since 1932. Thank you to all of you who are helping that effort. Um, and we've been sharing this data with the National Weather Service since 1969. And in 2006, we added our first weather station. Um, and here is a map where you can see where all of the other weather stations are. And so we uh, have a lot of spatial information about specific um, weather patterns across our sites. Um, but we also need to spend uh, extensive time in maintaining these weather stations and all of our sensors out in the field to ensure that everything's working correctly and the data is valid. And we could not do that without the wonderful Amartya Saha who is photographed here. Um, and then the data management team has to do something with this data to make it available for our researchers. So, um, and to perform automated QC algorithms. Um, and so we have invested in a software that is called Kisters and they have this web data viewer. And here you can see um, the points where all the data is that is available to be downloaded and, and interacted with. So here's an example of in that platform where you can see the daily min and max temperatures since 1970. And if we zoom in, uh, to the last four years, you can see the seasonal variation and even a note, uh, even a few freezes. You can also look at extreme weather events. So this is Hurricane Irma. Oh, what did I just do? Which is the pointer, the middle one? Yeah, okay. So this is Hurricane Irma. Um, and so here in red, we've got the rainfall coming in first. The blue is the maximum wind or is the wind and the green is the wind gusts. And so you can see the rain is coming in first, followed by this intense wind event. So it's really cool to look at all of those data sets together. Um, and we're also one of NOAA's climate reference network sites, which is another weather station, which is located on the reserve. Um, and it's maintained mostly by NOAA, um, but they have even more sensors than what we have. And they collect five minute data where we're collecting 15 minute data. A handful of our weather stations at Black Island Ranch are co-located with Eddy Covariance Towers, which measure carbon and methane fluxes. Um, you can see one here and require specialized expertise to operate and analyze the data. <clears throat> and we can learn a lot about the carbon cycle on a cattle ranch using these sensors, which can potentially inform future carbon markets for agriculture. But we also have to protect this sensitive equipment during fires. Um, it's such an important part of our ecosystem here, but we really want to keep these sensors in place so we can understand what's happening with the carbon cycle um, during a fire event. So let's move on to hydrology. Here you can see an aerial shot of the station dotted with seasonal wetlands. Um, and here is a map of all of the seasonal ponds that we've been measuring their levels at, at the station. We've got the northern half of the station and the southern half of the station here. We also have groundwater wells. So the station groundwater wells are over here and the ranch groundwater wells are over here. You can see it's a ton of information understanding that um, groundwater movement. Not only do we collect our own hydrology data, we also allow others to collect data on our site, such as the water management districts, um, which have groundwater wells here and here up by Lake Annie. And you can't talk about hydrology without talking about Lake Annie. Um, so in we've had a buoy for, for many years, but in 2022, we launched this next generation profiling buoy where the instruments travel from the surface to the bottom every 20 minutes, collecting a variety of parameters. Um, and there's also a weather station and instruments, instrumentation at the surface so we can understand what's going on at the surface level, surface level of the, the lake. The vertical profiles provide insights into subsurface algal blooms and the lake's ability to mix from top to bottom, controlling nutrients for algae and oxygen for animals. Um, and so the buoy data are helping scientists understand how this tropical nutrient poor lake compares to other lakes around the globe, especially as part of the GLEON or Global Lakes Ecological Observatory Network. Let's move on to biodiversity. So here we'll start with what we call our corridor observatory, which I'm sure Joe will be talking a little bit more about. Um, in this project, we've got co-located camera traps and acoustic monitors, and we're using non-invasive wildlife monitoring techniques to capture a lot of the wildlife across a broad spectrum of landscape types and habitats in South Florida. So uh, this zoomed in look shows the intensity at which we're collecting these data on the three sites. We've got the station, the ranch, and DeLuca Preserve with over 40 um, sensors at each site. 
<clears throat> and the cameras are Reconyx Hyperfire cellular models, and our acoustic devices are Cornell Lab of Ornithology Swift One units. And this data results in hundreds of terabytes of data per year, um, which is then pushed to the cloud for um, analysis in places like um, NSF Cyverse or USDA SciNet, um, where we can apply machine learning, learning algorithms uh, for species identification. You'll learn a little bit more about the training cycle for machine learning when Joe talks, but essentially we're curating new images, creating a training data set to train the model, evaluating the model, and improving the model. And it's an iterative process that refines the model with each iteration and helps uh, better identify species, especially thinking about um, backgrounds, so what habitat the, the species are in. Just some of my favorites. <laughs> really special to get that with the sound and the images at one site. Hard to hear that one, but. <laughs> um, so other ways that we monitor biodiversity is through our natural history collection. So Archbold has a large on-site multi-taxon curated collection, which acts as, as a reference collection for our area, which is rich in local flora and fauna. You can see the number of specimens in our collection in the yellow box, um, many of which have been database imaged and uploaded to online repositories for each taxa. You can see about 44,000 specimens online representing over 11,000 species. And now let's talk about drones, another way to uh, monitor the environment. So it all started with prescribed fires. We all know how important fire is to the ecosystems in which we work. Um, we've been mapping fires as early as 1967, um, although paper maps and descriptions go as far back as 1931. Um, the first two drones that we acquired were our DJI Phantom 4 Pro um, and our Mavic 2 Pro. And these are still our workhorse drones when it comes to collecting RGB imagery. RGB is red, green, blue, so it's just the visible light portion of the spectrum. We soon realized that we were going to need a bigger drone to support some of the more advanced sensors that we wanted to uh, get. So we acquired the DJI Matrice 300 RTK, which some of you may have seen out in the parking lot over the past couple of weeks. Um, it's capable of carrying much heavy sensors. And we also at that same time acquired this MicaSense Red Edge MX camera, um, which captures multi-spectral data. So it's five bands, you can see the five, um, lenses there. We've got red, green, blue, red edge, and near infrared, and those two are important for monitoring vegetation health. Well, you can't really see that beautiful drone shot. Sorry about that, <laughs> um, but I wanted to talk about a couple more of the drone projects that we have done that have resulted in publication. So the first one is measuring the gaps in the rosemary bulbs. So if you think back to Jenny Schaefer's photos of the rosemary bulbs and talking about the gaps here, um, and instead of being able to manually track where all these gaps are, we can use drones to do that. Um, we can do that without a LIDAR sensor because uh, just the RGB imagery is really good at being able to tell where there is a lack of vegetation. Um, so we were able to map those gaps pretty accurately and um, we are going back and continuing to fly over those rosemary bulbs um, to detect change over time, but they have a really long fire return interval, so we don't have to fly them very frequently. Um, another project is uh, this one, which was from Kamenovsky et al. And uh, there we did a classification of vegetation communities pre and post fire. So you've got the vegetation community pre fire. And post fire, you can see it drastically changed. The yellow is sand. Uh, the green is emergent vegetation um, coming in. So you can see it's starting to come in in the middle. Interestingly enough, the black that you can see in here is hog rooting. So we were able to detect that as well. Um, but really, what we wanted to do here was get more refined and understand some of the IDs of the species that were living in this wetland, the plant species. But the sensors that we had didn't allow us to do that. So we just had to settle for vegetation communities, which was good enough for this analysis. So where are we going? We need new sensors. <laughs> um, so um, we recently received a new conservation innovation grant through NRCS. Thank you to Aaron David and Betsy Boughton. Um, and we are looking at uh, identifying drone technologies, evaluating drone technologies to identify woody encroachment. So we got a uh, LIDAR sensor, which is the DJI Zenmuse L1. 
and the Headwell, Headwall Nano HP Hyperspectral Sensor. So this is a first look, how do I play, um, of the LIDAR data that Ali and I captured last week. So here you can see the learning center and the lodge. The parking lot is in front. Here's the line of trees with the railroad line behind it. As we turn around, you can see Quirkus Cottage over here. You can see the parking lot. You can see how it's really able to depict which leaves go with which trees. Um, it's really, really, I think it's going to be really powerful and really useful. Um, and this is just from its maiden voyage, which was last week. So <laughs> we'll be prepared to see a lot more of these really cool images coming up. Um, I'm just waiting for it to turn around because I think it's really cool that you can't really see where Main Drive is right now because it's so filled with trees. But as we turn around, it will pop up into our view. Um, and here is a maiden voyage of our hyperspectral sensor. So this is really interesting because you can get the spec, the full spectral signature of different points on that. Um, so it's a little bit hard to see the image here, but this blue point is in the parking lot and this red point is in the grass outside of Quirkus Cottage. And that relates to this graph over here. So along the bottom, along the X axis, we have the wavelengths. And so you've got visible light that goes about here to here. And then everything beyond that is the non-visible light area of the spectrum. So the blue, which is again, the dot in the parking lot is fully saturated in the blue in the visible light, which makes black, right? All the colors together makes this dark, dark color here. And the grass, you can see there's a spike in the green area, but then where most of the activity is, is in this red edge and near infrared band. And so you can learn a lot about different species by looking at those non-visible portions of the spectrum. Um, and so the ultimate goal here is to be able to use these spectral graphs to be able to potentially hopefully identify species. Um, so just to sum it up, lessons learned that we have is that you must integrate data management from the very beginning and provide funding to it. Archbold has been so successful in all of this work because we have invested in data management um, and had institutional buy-in to justify costs. All of you are using all of these data for all of the projects that everyone is presenting. Um, it's more work to fix things later than to set them up right at the beginning, so taking that time. And there are tools and organizations out there that are meant to help you. You just need to find them, and that is what we've been working to do. And of course, we couldn't do any of this work with the GIS and data management team, so a big thank you to Chef Angeline, Angela, and Ellen. Um, I know Eric's setting up, so maybe you're going to I'm reminded from the um so the yep so the question is about comparing photogrammetry um which can map tree canopies and things like that as opposed to lidar um so that was what we initially did when we were looking because you should be able to get at vegetation height using just the rgb values um and so we did a lot of work with that and we just found that it wasn't wildly accurate you could compare areas from here to there to get relative height, but not actual height. Um, and so we couldn't find many uses for it. You couldn't also couldn't do things. We did a project trying to do smut grass and smut grass wasn't tall enough to be really significant than other grasses um, according to the photogrammetry. So we're just exploring and playing with things and trying to figure out what works and what doesn't work. Um, and we were able to use the use for the photogrammetry um, with mapping the bulbs because it is very accurate at mapping where there is a lack of vegetation. So that is, kind of where we are, where we've taken it, but we're exploring. And if people have ideas for projects, we'd be happy to do some tests to figure it out. Yeah. 
what is the say this again? Sorry, okay. What is the vertical and horizontal? So she is the lidar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, um, it's it's less than a centimeter. I believe. It's extremely accurate. Yeah. Okay. All right. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Okay. My name is Eric Mingus, and I was uh, the program director in Plant Ecology Lab for thirty-three years uh, before Aaron took over, and I retired. And uh, this is my first uh, scientific talk in over three years, so be nice to me. <laughs> uh, but what I'd like to do is talk about two projects that I'm starting to take advantage of some of the long-term uh, data we collected over these 33 years. And uh, our foci during the time I was there are plant demography, fire ecology and management and conservation and restoration and a lot of the interactions between these two. So we collected a lot of long-term data on uh, a couple dozen plant species, including a lot of rare species that then we, uh, was important to consider uh, land management and conservation and restoration. Uh, we did a lot of introductions uh, as well, we, and that's still going on under Aaron's leadership. And a lot of work with fire ecology, effects of fire on individual plants, on populations and on communities. Um, and working on fire management uh, along with Kevin Maine. So that's kind of the, the things that are coming together. And uh, today I'd like to talk about two projects. Uh, I've spent most of the time talking about a project. I'm starting with Pedro Quintana Sencio at University of Central Florida and Aaron David. And we're trying to look at, particularly at weather as drivers of vital rates and then build models with weather to look at uh, population dynamics. So vital rates are things like survival or recruitment, uh, growth, and uh, we have these long-term data, uh, demography data sets, and then you know, Viv just mentioned the fantastic weather data sets we have here. So we're getting, our plan is to look at individual species, but using uh, fairly consistent protocols um, in terms of the variables and in terms of the model selection, all those, all those things. So uh, we start with the demography data where we have uh, multiple years of data. I'll show you some more detail, up to 34 years of data. Uh, some of these projects are ongoing. So uh, uh, the number 34 is, is gonna be higher when we get into some of those data sets. Uh, many different sites, about two thirds of uh, the sites we worked on were not at Archibald, they're in Florida Scrub up and down the Lake Wales Ridge. And lots of different management practices involved here, including fire and different kinds of mechanical uh, treatments as well. Uh, these are a few of the data sets that we worked on showing uh, a whole number of uh, uh, years, and some of them are ongoing. This, they're, they're continuing some of them. Uh, many populations and some big data sets, over 10,000 individual hypericum cumulicula plants that we followed over the years. And I want to point out that we're not starting from scratch. We have a lot of uh, analyses and population viability analyses that we've been able to publish over the years. And so I, some of the references are shown here. This is just a partial list of those. So we're gonna try to build models for individual species vital rates based on site and year. And then more interestingly, uh, based on fire variables like time since fire and weather variables. There's a lot of variables you can come up with from weather data sets, and we're trying to explore different variables kind of based on our own knowledge of what things seem to, to drive uh, things like ceiling recruitment or uh, annual survival. So obviously there's gonna be temperature variables and, and in particular different rainfall variables like the number of rainfall events during a period of time that we hypothesize is crucial to a particular vital rate. And Viv mentioned the great weather data at Archbold, and there's also other uh, public weather sites that have available data in, say, the Sebring area or up in Polk County, where we will also have demographic data. So we'll come up with uh, some weather variables that are similar across species. So ultimately, we want to be able to put all this together and say, what are the weather variables that are driving 
uh, scrub plant dynamics. So uh, in this particular project, we're gonna uh, start with uh, long data sets and pull out the central third of the data set to build models. Uh, those models might be recruitment as a function of rainfall and temperature, for instance, something like that. So once we build the models based on that data, then we're gonna first of all look within uh, the central area to see how good the model is predicting the numbers of plants from the vital rates, uh, which is not always as successful as it should be. There's a large literature on how poor uh, different kinds of demographic models are at actually projecting even within the time frame. But we hope that works. And then we're going to try to see the, how these models forecast the dynamics before and after these central years using the weather data from those years, which is it was just more powerful than just saying, well, what, what's the population dynamics without having these drivers? And um, we might see uh, a divergence between the actual and projected. We might see a quantitative divergence. We might actually see, change, see a difference in the direction of changes in, in population sizes, for instance. And there's a lot of things that could be uh, causing this divergence, of course, the models may be poor. Um, the relationship of weather to vital rates may be changing as the weather changes or as there's year-to-year -year variation. Um, the ecosystems themselves are changing. Uh, fire regimes, changing climate, changing hydrology may have effects. And uh, there's even a possibility in these short-lived species that there's a little bit of evolution going on over decades. Uh, if there's you know, some really strong selective pressures from weather or from fire changes. So the kind of species that will provide the best analyses, we have some data sets for a long time series is important. Good weather data is important. Good fire data, the you know, Archibald is the gold standard for that. The other sites we worked at a little bit sometimes harder to pull out the fire data, but there's been a lot of advances in that over the last couple of decades. And species with dynamic demography, ones that have turnover, higher mortality, faster growth, are gonna provide probably a better signal than the uh, long-lived shrubs that kind of sit there and very seldom change, uh, die and don't grow very fast. So as an example, a Rhizium cuneifolium, a, a rare scrub plant specializing in rosemary scrub, these are some of our data showing population numbers. And you can see there's been a lot of change of kind of a general decline. And then in the last decade or two, some more increases. But if you dig down to the individual populations, some are increasing while others are increasing. Some of these increases are due to fire, but we think some of the dynamics are gonna be due to weather. So in the case of Eryngium, we, uh, since 1988, we sampled uh, every fall in November. Aaron's continuing to collect these data uh, at Archbold. We have other sites as well. And we're hypothesizing that a winter rainfall is gonna increase germination. The germination period is uh, December to February. And that spring drought is causing a lot of seedling mortality. So that the recruitment of Eryngium by the following November we think will be com a combination of favorable conditions, sorry, favorable conditions in the spring and the fall. Um, in case you guys don't know, this is a, what a uh, vegetative plant of Eryngium looks like. This is what the seedlings look like. And this is what it looks like when uh, Aaron and his crew go out, or and when I did it, we go out and flag seedlings and then collect the data and then remove the flags in some cases. Uh, so, the recruitment uh, over time is also importantly skewed by fire. So these are some individual fires that it looks like is causing a burst of recruitment just after. That's driving those some of those population dynamics changes. And so uh, we haven't really started this project very much yet, but we did some preliminary analyses showing uh, precipitation on the x-axis and recruitment on the y-axis. This is the sum of precipitation in the winter and the number of precipitation events over a tenth of an inch of rain and the same for the spring. See there's this outlier here, but if you 
if you take away that outlier, especially you can see a general positive response that we'd expect. And we did a real simple ANOVA on this showing that uh, both the winter and the spring precipitation and the interaction have effects on recruitment. Um, since I'm working with Pedro, we'll be doing uh, Bayesian analyses when we do this for real. Don't ask me to explain that. Okay, um, the second project I'm talking about is a little more straightforward. I'm not gonna spend too much time on it. I'm working with Richard Shefferson from the University of Tokyo. And what Richard is interested in doing is looking at what kinds of modeling approaches uh, work best to predict the population dynamics of herbaceous perennials. And so he's assembling these demographic data sets from the literature from all over the world um, and using, and I won't bore you with this, different kinds of approaches, Leslie Lefkovich matrices, historical matrices, uh, integral projection modeling, um, and trying to see which of them seem to be better at providing decent projections for herbaceous perennial plants. So he's taking the data sets, the first half of the data set to parameterize the models to predict the second half of the data set, which is something that's been done in the past by other folks, but probably not, uh, not so many different kinds of modeling approaches involved. So he needs raw data sets that are at least 20 years in length. So he got in touch with me and I'm working with him and kind of providing him with the raw data to build these models. Um, and he's accumulated uh, agreements from other his own, his own work on this orchid and other researchers uh, with some long-term data sets. This data set on this uh, Hawaiian silver sword over 40 years long, that's one of the ones he's gonna use. So he's basically looking at population size primarily the second half of the study using the first half to parameterize the models and looking at the difference uh, of differences in this over time um, and, and seeing which uh, analytical modeling technique produces the lowest differences and to see whether there's certain, uh, certain uh, aspects of the pattern that uh, recommend one technique over another. He's also gonna look at some other demographic responses, including population growth rate and sensitivity and elasticity. And uh, we'll see how that goes. And that's all I have to say, thank you. So any immediate Eric, could you repeat the question for the folks online? Pardon me. I didn't actually understand the question. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. So the Leslie matrices require age in most people, unless you follow uh, cohorts of seedlings, you won't have the age. You know, you go out there right now and look at a plant, you know, all this. So the Lefkovich models are better for size. The historical models not only look at the previous year, but the previous year before that requires more data. But if there's delays in, say, the, the effect of, of a large flowering bout in, in 2014 on ceiling recruitment in 2016, you can get that. So the models have different data requirements, and, and some of them are more practical than others. So. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, I was curious. Um, the the uh, scientists in Tokyo, what portion of the data sets are you working on? Should they just do? Well, we haven't negotiated that yet, but I probably have uh, a 10 data sets that he could use that are 20 years long, um, maybe more, but so. And is he working with hundreds or tens? Well, right now he's only got about six data sets. So I, I, was, I would say there's, you know, there may, be, there may be 30 or 40 data sets out there that exist. Uh, there's been studies that show uh, the, 
the uh, median length of the data set in plant demography is about three or four years, about the time for a PhD project. And that's probably, that's probably not a coincidence. So it's the longer term data sets, um, people ask me all the time, is it worth collecting this long-term data? And for these kind of studies, it's important. You can't do this with six years of data. It's just not going to work. I, I just emphasize that because it really, yeah, you know, it's really the, uh, when you do your NCs work, you again provided many, much more, you again provided many of the data sets. And on an international project, there you are offering maybe a 25% of the Yeah, data. you know, and it's not me. I, I should have said it at the beginning. This is Archibald supporting a long term field based work that doesn't necessarily require a grant to start it up. And then once people get five, 10 years of data, there's opportunities for to get funding. Back to you. Yeah, we'll, we will look at that. I, th I think the better models would only have, you know, three to six variables. We'll use um, AI, a Bayesian version of AIC to try to sort through that and avoid, you know, extreme data mining. 